I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and today I have a relatively simple project planned. And this dyeing project we're gonna do on Nomad Snowdrift. Snowdrift is 75% superwash merino wool, 25% nylon, and Nomad gave this to me for free to play around with. I think they have a newer select version, which is slightly softer. I would say it's still very soft, but maybe not quite as soft as say Stroll or Platinum, but I still like it a lot. I'm doing things in this video a little out of order today, starting with <laughs> the yarn and not our project. But that's because you probably know the project from the title of the video. We are gonna dip dye this yarn into Dharma's Emerald Green Acid Dye. Emerald Green is a color that is a lot of fun to play with. It tends to strike uh, to yarn on the slower side, but I have observed when we've dip dyed it mixed with other colors, we've had some fluorescence at the end. And I know that emerald green on its own, there's enough blues in there that you don't really see any fluorescence, but what will we get if we dip dye just into the emerald green? And so that is our goal today. Now I'm pre-soaking our 100 grams of yarn in just some plain tap water with no acid. I haven't added any acid in here yet. And I'm planning to do this video with a dye stock of emerald green that I made some number of months ago. I don't know how much dye we'll have, but we'll measure it so we know how much we use. But whenever I'm using an older dye stock, I like to have a little asterisk there because although I made this as a 1% stock originally, where I had one gram of dye dissolved in 100 milliliters of liquid, sometimes when stocks are older, dye can crash out and settle towards the bottom of the bottle. And so since I've been using this over months, if it hasn't been well mixed, we could have slightly more dye down at the bottom than I did when I originally mixed it. And so therefore, for the most repeatable results, you should always start with fresh dye stocks or ones that you've made fairly recently. Uh, which is just something I want to throw out there because there was one time I tried to replicate something and the colors came out way darker than I thought <laughs> until I made a new stock and measured out the dye. So I always like to caution that. But anyway, I'm going to let this yarn pre-soak for at least 30 minutes. It's okay if it's a little longer, but I want the yarn to be well saturated. And if you wanna learn more about any of the tools or equipment, I will have links and affiliate links down in the video description. And if you make a purchase through one of my affiliate links, I may earn a commission. But all the affiliate links are very clearly marked. We've got a nice graduated cylinder here. I'm gonna shake up our bottle well. And we're gonna pour. I always protect my work surface with an Ikea shower curtain. And ooh, we might finally finish up this dye stock. Now, I don't see any powders or anything down at the bottom. And it looks like we have 70 milliliters of this dye stock, but I'm planning on rinsing out the stock solution bottle. So that might give us a couple more milliliters, but yeah, that's how much dye we have. <laughs> In our dye bath, uh, we have 16 cups of water. And since today I'm doing a lot of things out of order, let's add the rinse from our stock solution bottle first. It looks like a lot of liquid, but once it's in, that's really not that much pigment because you'll see how it changes when I add the rest of the dye. Because now that I have our 70 milliliters of the stock, you can just see the color shift and change. Now, obviously, there is more dye in what I poured out than rinsing the stock solution bottle. But I really just wanted to demonstrate that sometimes rinsing out a bottle doesn't have enough pigment to drastically change the color. Occasionally it might, but most of the time it doesn't. Okay, 16 cups of water plus some. Let's start with four tablespoons of white vinegar. We'll probably need to add more, but that's a good starting place. I'm going to stir things up, but now I'm going to heat it until we start seeing some bubbles and then we'll start dip dyeing. All right, I'm going to reduce the heat to medium and we'll start dip dyeing our yarn. Now, when I've dip dyed into emerald green with in combination with other colors, we're using a lot less than 70. <laughs> milliliters and so uh, hopefully I won't 
regret anything. And if we don't end up seeing fluorescence at the end, that doesn't mean it was a failure. It just means that there's still too many blue pigments uh, around to see it. Because ultimately, I think the ability to see a fluorescent dye molecule and to see the glow depends on the proportion of the fluorescent pigments to other dye molecules. Uh, because if you have a lot of things in there that aren't fluorescent and that are absorbing the light, you might not see that fluorescence. Uh, this, is so, this color green is so lovely. I'm not anticipating visually seeing color breaking. If I were to dip dye into a number of different colors, including, say, radioactive, which is a green that is fluorescent, I might expect to see more green at one end and more yellow at the other. But that's because we know radioactive breaks and we see those blue strike faster than the fluorescent yellow pigments. And I am not anticipating that we're going to see fluorescent yellow at this end. I'm expecting we're going to see a dark to light green gradient. But maybe it's possible that even if some proportions are similar, we may have more of the blues at the bottom than the top. It's just not going to be a stark visual contrast. And as I'm dipping slowly, slowly and carefully, trying to really take my time here, why do we care about fluorescence? Many of you may not. Uh, it's fun to know what might glow if you go to, say, a museum or something with a black light, or, you know, when my kids had a black light art show. Uh, there, there is just fun <laughs> with having fluorescence, and really that's it. Uh, I think for most people that isn't something that they necessarily care about, but I enjoy exploring and observing yarn that glows because it makes me happy and it makes me excited. So hopefully you enjoy seeing that excitement. But at this stage, I've clearly added all of the yarn into the pan. I do want to add a little more acid. Let's go ahead and add four more tablespoons of white vinegar just to help the rest of these colors strike uh, so that way they bind. Uh, we might still see some green in the water. We may not, but I'm going to set a timer for 30 minutes and we'll see where we are then. It has been 30 minutes. Let's see. All right, we still have a little bit of green in the pot. That unfortunately is not majorly surprising. And I'm debating what I want to do because this may be a bleeder later on. I could remove it, but I think what I'm going to do is turn off the heat and leave the yarn here in the pot for a little bit of time. And I'm hesitating because sometimes you want to leave your yarn in the dye bath until all the color has absorbed. But with certain colors that are notorious bleeders, sometimes you don't want that last little bit of color to absorb because that's the stuff that would wash out when you go and wash the yarn. So that is me being super, super, super torn. The, the pot's warm. I'm going to compromise. I'm going to leave the yarn in here, I think, for 30 more minutes, and then I will go ahead and remove it. So 30 minutes, but the heat's off. So, a compromise. It's been 30 minutes of cooling down. We still have some steaminess going on. And there's less color in, but there's still some color. I'm anticipating we're gonna have a bleeder here. Ugh. And I see my white balance is off. Things are looking way more blue uh, on the yarn than they do in person, where we have very much like a Crayola green going on here. But anyway. I'm gonna let the yarn cool off completely and then we can wash it. Let's wash our fabulous green yarn. And fingers crossed we have no bleeding. Oh, yeah, because I don't know if it feels that way, but it does feel like this is, it's hard to say if there's breaking, right? Because this is both deeper, uh, but is it more blue? Things like that are really subtle and hard to say. There are a lot more dramatic uh, examples of breaking out there. 
Okay, I just added a little bit of some clear dish soap to run around our yarn. I always rinse my yarn with cool water. And it's hard to say, there's maybe like the tiniest hint, but overall, I would say this is looking great. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna fill this up. Do, do, do. Yeah. I think we're pretty good. Huh. I am so excited to look at this under a black light, but we're gonna wait for our conclusions. We will. And in the meantime, Make sure you leave some comments down below, or maybe it's now off to the side, YouTube has moved things around, but leave some comments with other types of videos you might like to see, because I filmed this one after getting some of your requests. And so I do try to keep track of requests and suggestions for colorways and experiments and various things. So it never hurts to suggest something. I'm struggling to represent this color accurately on camera which again perplexes me because a lot of times the color that I have trouble sort of adjusting the white balance and getting right are the reds, especially in purples. Uh, they can end up looking too pink or too blue, but the green here, yeah, I, I, I'm just not capturing it well on camera. It is stunning though. But now the moment we have been waiting for, turning off most of the lights in here and bringing over my black light, Oh, we have glow. We have glow. Oh my gosh. It worked. Now, is there glow in this upper area? I mean, maybe a tiny, tiny bit. But the bigger thing that I see up there is a lot of it is blocked, likely because of those blues. But let's turn this off and back on. I mean, I think that this is some evidence of some amount of breaking that we have here. There are pigments that are striking faster than others in our emerald green. But Rebecca, we see two greens here, and one of them isn't a significantly more yellow green, it's just less saturated. And visually, what we see, yes, that's true. But seeing fluorescence in a color like a green or a purple, comes down to the ratio of the fluorescent dye molecule to the non-fluorescent dye molecule, to an extent. Consider the new colors that Jacquard released. They released a purple, what do they call it, vivid violet, and it does have fluorescent pink in there, but they don't market that color as fluorescent because the fluorescence you see is minimal because there's enough blue in there to make it become a really vibrant purple. Whereas Purple Pop from Derma really is very pink leaning. It's just bluer than fluorescent fuchsia. And the only other reason why I'm thinking about this is because I know from talking with Jacquard's uh, chemists that black light blue has the ratio of the colorless fluorescent acid dye to the blue pigment in there that makes it glow is important because if you add too much blue, the fluorescence won't be as dramatic but you want to see the blue, and so that was a balancing act that they had to do. And so here, the green at the end, I wouldn't necessarily call it neon, I would call it a vibrant green, but the fact that we're seeing the fluorescence there, and the fluorescence is so much stronger at that light end, is indicating to me that the ratio of the fluorescent yellow to whatever blue or green pigments are in the mix, uh, there's more of the fluorescent molecule to other molecules here than down there. Now, I'm assuming if we were to dip dye in just fluorescent lemon, we would see more yellow at one side and less at the other. We likely have a gradient there. It's just proportionally, the colors are striking at different rates. I hope that this makes sense. <laughs> Ultimately, what we have here is a beautiful dip dyed green colorway. It's not something that I would market as fluorescent, even though it does glow, but it was a happy surprise. And again, emerald green is not marketed as a fluorescent green dye because it's not. If you look at just the emerald green by itself, you don't see that glow. It's only in the dip dyeing process, changing up those ratios that you see the fluorescence. But this does mean you can add a bit more blue to radioactive to get that vibrant paler green. 
Uh, and I mean, I guess that's all ratios you have to play with. I think the other reason why this worked so well is fluorescent yellow acid dyes are super, super vibrant. They are the most vibrant, they give off the most light, and the pinks are never quite as bright. And so therefore, when you add some blues to the pink, you very quickly lose the fluorescence that you have there. Whereas with the yellow, it's really easy to keep that present. But anyway, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and I really hope that you have enjoyed this video. I know that I had a ton of fun exploring the fluorescence of this colorway. And doing small projects about this can answer questions and things that we have, and it's giving me a new understanding and appreciation for emerald green as a dye, because it definitely spreads a lot. It does not strike very fast, especially compared with other colors. And so understanding and learning I mean, I suppose I could look. You can look up colors and find out what's in them, although sometimes they do say on websites that it's a mix of different pigments. But if you were to look closer, you could probably find out what's in there, and then maybe that would help you understand. But there are so many more acid dye pigments than, say, there are food coloring pigments that are available in the US. So when it comes to food coloring, I know the six different food coloring molecules fairly well on the rates that they buy in yarn, I can sort of rank them in order. And I have a very good understanding there looking at an ingredients list what will happen. When it comes to acid dyes, I don't quite have that same innate feel. I have a good feel for certain pre-mixed blends or primaries, but I can't necessarily look at a new dye color and look at the ingredients and tell you what's gonna happen. Please subscribe, turn on notifications, like the video, do all those youtube -y things, but also let me know in the comments what other dyeing projects and experiments you would like to see. I try to keep track of as many of your comments as I can, and sometimes a follow-up like this ends up letting me reflect and learn in a way that is really, really fun for me, and I hope it's really fun for you as well. I know that I really, really enjoy doing this type of project and what we learned, and ah, oh, because ultimately, the dyeing project is very simple. Took some emerald green acid dye, we dip dyed some yarn into it, bing, bang, boom. But I learned a lot in the process, and so that's just a lot of fun. But anyway, thank you so much for watching.